Welcome everyone to our panel today. So we'll just do a quick uh, intro of everyone here and then we'll get into discussion around electric vehicles. Really exciting, we have different panelists uh, focusing on one that just did a SPAC uh, with XOS Trucks. We have one of our portfolio companies, Einride, which has some big news hopefully soon and, and uh, continuously growing like crazy. And then uh, terawatt infrastructure as well on the startup side. So a little bit about plug and play. Uh, plug and play is in Silicon Valley. We're one of the most active early stage investors. Uh, we do over 200 investments a year into startup companies. Uh, we, my team that I started about four years ago just looks at supply chain startups. So we invest in everything from the end to end supply chain. So electric vehicles are something we look at in supply chain, uh, but also in other areas like mobility. So yeah, we're super excited about uh, the opportunities in electric vehicles. Uh, plug and play is invested now in about 30 unicorns. So uh, we invest stage agnostically, primarily pre-seed, seed. Some of our best uh, investments are like Dropbox, PayPal, uh, Lending Club. Uh, we, we had a great exit last year with Honey, which is a coupon platform. So uh, we're excited. There's many more coming in the logistics space. So with that, I'll let everyone do a little intro of themselves, and then we'll have a nice discussion around electric vehicles. So uh, I'll pass just to my, my left uh, with Thomas from uh, Einride. Cool. Thanks. Great being here, uh, of course. And... Uh, um well, I'm Thomas. Um, Enride is all about sustainable freight. We're helping large companies to transform their current logistics uh, out of diesel uh, to, over time, tr uh, transform fully into uh, electric heavy freight. And uh, with that, we deploy both um, manned and unmanned um, heavy um, electric trucks. Uh, we're based out of Sweden. We've been around for um, since back in 2016. Uh, we have our trucks, uh, one of our autonomous trucks here on sites. Um, and um, we're just very, very passionate about the, the transition uh, to sustainable heavy freight, which uh, is something that uh, we've been kind of very much challenging the rest of the market in how it's done. Uh, but now we've been live. We went to public road first time in, in 2019 already to get with customers and have a whole bunch of flows, both here in America, but also over in, in Sweden, uh, we're working on that. But I've been live with uh, our other electric heavy trucks since uh, a few years back and running them at scale and did this huge announcement that we, we got 120 uh, um, heavy electric trucks out of, of Daimler uh, man trucks that we, um, it was the largest heavy electric truck order in the world uh, at that point. So, so yeah, that's a few things about Enright. Thanks, Thomas. Okay, next let's pass to you, uh, Niha from uh, Terawatt Infrastructure. Hi, uh, Neha Palmer from Terawatt Infrastructure. We are a company that builds large-scale electric vehicle charging hubs, specifically focused on the medium-duty and heavy-duty vehicle class. Uh, we are a platform that provides a full-stack solution, so we are able to own these sites uh, that will have this charging, develop all of the infrastructure required, the power requirements, uh, all of the charging infrastructure, and when you're talking about something this large, you will also have a fair amount of energy infrastructure on site. And once these sites are up and running, being able to manage them and uh, integrate uh, within a fleet's charging uh, needs. Uh, what we're really excited about is we're starting to see a lot more of these vehicles come to market, and we know that the demand for charging is gonna be intense. Uh, it's not a small task to build charging at this scale. It's certainly a month-long to sometimes many years-long process. And so, you know, it's my goal and our goal as Terawatt to make sure that as these vehicles come to market, that we have charging solutions and that is not the bottleneck in terms of this transition to electrified transport. Thanks. Okay, you're next. Yeah, I'm Gio from Exos Trucks. Exos Trucks is a manufacturer of medium and heavy-duty trucks. But beyond the hardware, we also provide services and support to fleets and can handle anything they need from the entire transition from a diesel fleet to electric. So we get involved with charging and maintenance and telematics and bringing data to the table from the trucks and from the chargers to make intelligent decisions and make that transition from diesel to electric as, as smooth as possible. So we've had production vehicles on the road with some of the, the largest fleets in the world for a couple of years now and are continuing to scale up our efforts. Um, we, we are primarily building and delivering uh, delivery vehicles, so step van, kind of parcel bodies right now, and working on uh, medium duty box trucks and, and chassis cabs as well. Awesome, thanks so much, Gio. And would love to hear your thoughts on electrification in the trucking industry. I know 
you guys are, did a SPAC are now public, and there's been crazy hype around startups like uh, that have gone public in a similar space, and a lot of overvalued startups, a lot of companies that are, are doing extremely well. What are your thoughts on uh, the industry as a whole? Obviously, it's a big trend that we see that in the industry that it needs to become more sustainable. Electric vehicles are something that are challenging to bring to market, and we'll talk about infrastructure after, but we'd love to hear your thoughts on electrification with the trucking industry. Yeah, a simple way that we like to think about it is that anything that can go electric will go electric. So right now, that's mostly commercial vehicles that are doing 200 miles or less, and those are the segments that we're going after. A parcel delivery truck that's doing you know, urban delivery, for those of us that were stuck at home during the pandemic, notice just how many times these delivery vehicles show up to our door. Uh, those are all routes that are doing probably 60 to 70 miles a day, very well-defined route, and they return to the same home base at night. So we can help our fleet customers install chargers at the home, their home base so that they can plug in and charge overnight. Uh, and that's where we're focused. It's not the entire vehicle population of the United States or the world overnight. Uh, it's gonna take a while to push from 200 miles into you know, 250, 300 over time um, as the technology improves. And a lot of that's in battery technology, but there's you know, a million different ways to add efficiency um, to, to the operation kind of soup to nuts. And so part of that's what Einride is doing, part of that is what Terawatt is doing to uh, look at more creative ways to charge vehicles um, rather than just, you know, as fast as possible in, in one sitting, for example. Awesome. So maybe next let's talk about infrastructure, because I think one of the biggest challenges to actually having scale with electric vehicles is the infrastructure, and I know that's what Terawatt is, is working on, so we'd love to hear your perspective on infrastructure and how that's going to scale with the trucking industry. Yeah, you know, I think we're at a really big inflection point within the industry. Um, these vehicles are finally coming to market, I think we've all kind of been, as you said, anything that can electrify will electrify, and we've seen that the trajectory is gonna happen, but this year really feels like the year where a lot of vehicles are coming to market, people who put their orders in are starting to receive them at scale, and what we're hearing is, oh crap, <laughs> that you know, we put these orders in maybe 18 months ago or even longer, you know, they had put, that, put this as part of their long-term plan, and now that they're coming to market and they're coming into their yards, they're realizing that it's a much bigger challenge to charge a large number of vehicles than it might have been to pilot. And so what we really think about is how do we get that scale uh, as you start to have a larger percentage of each fleet electrified? Um, you know, it's not a small undertaking to bring the amount of power that you need for some of these larger scale vehicles. Specifically, if there's also charging simultaneously, um, the peak power need is quite large. And so we're building out these hubs in order to bring the nexus of all those things, the charging infrastructure, the power requirements, um, and hopefully optimizing that site for multiple fleets, perhaps, uh, to really leverage all of the investment into the infrastructure and drive that lowest cost of charging. Uh, I think that you know, the cost of charging is something that people have in their mind. Um, and infrastructure is the number one driver of that besides the cost of electricity. So thinking about, uh, you know, that, again, the entire stack of things that needs to come together to provide large-scale charging, um, it's, it's going to require the locations, the capital investment, um, new technology to start to manage across uh, different fleets and what's happening. And, you know, I, it's, it's, uh, certainly it's going to be a trajectory. Uh, you know, I mentioned it's a multi-year process to bring one of these things uh, up to being operational, and uh, quite a large number of stakeholders to do that. Uh, utilities, um, grid operators, grid owners, and we're really excited about the opportunity to work with fleets um, to understand their needs now and then what they will look like you know, 12, 18, 24 months from now, because we know it'll be significantly different what the, than what they have there today. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't get calls from our customers that say, all right, we got our chargers installed, now we're just looking for the trucks to work with them. It's always the other way around, right? So they'll, yeah. they'll want to know about the trucks, they'll make a purchasing decision, they'll get trucks delivered in some cases, and then you know, not, maybe not always be ready for uh, the charging infrastructure that's involved. So that's something that we, we also try to get in front of and try to encourage our fleets to think about in the very early stages of, of the buying process. Um, and, and you're right, it, it's not just the, you know, fleets need to think further out than just the demo vehicles. It's relatively easy to get five low-powered chargers installed, 20 kilowatts, 
uh, not a big infrastructure upgrade at the depot. But once you start talking about either fast charging or charging 20, 30, 40 vehicles at the same time, it's not just you know digging up uh, the ground and putting in a charger, it's looking at the building service. So a lot of the depots that we work with only have so much power available to, the, to them. They're using it for things like conveyor belts and air conditioning within the building. So at the end of the day, you're left with you know, not so much power to charge vehicles. And depending on the utility you're in, that could be a you know, three to 18 to 24 month process to upgrade the infrastructure at your building. It might even mean a substation upgrade for the utility. So that's a process that uh, we'd like to start on early. In the meantime, we developed a solution, a mobile charging station that we can deploy to those sites to fill that gap. So if a, a fleet does need to wait 18 months to get chargers installed, we can drop off a product that we call the hub, or the Exos hub, um, and it's a trailerized energy storage system that has plugs coming off of it. So they can charge you know, up to five vehicles at a time and have multiple of those solutions to bridge that gap between I have no infrastructure to being able to charge you know, 50 trucks at a time. Nice. Um, and now let's hear from Einride. Uh, Thomas, I know you guys had the big funding round, which we had a small part of, not as big as some of the other investors. But uh, Einride obviously uh, will require a lot of investment. It has a massive vision for the industry. Um, what are your views on when there will be the uh, tipping point of when uh, vehicles become electric? I know the business case is also challenging, so maybe you can talk through that. Yeah, I think um, some of the things that we just mentioned here, I think all comes down to three different kinds of anxieties around electric vehicles. You have the range anxiety, obviously. You have the cost anxiety, and you have the infrastructure anxiety. That's what we need to solve, and that's what we're solving. So we made this platform called Saga where we're uh, solving these different things with a, a whole suite of different apps that's tying the whole ecosystem together for what's needed to run these at scale. And, and how do we know that? Well, we, we currently are running one of the largest electric heavy fleets in Europe, uh, and we're just going to keep that uh, kind of position as we put in the order I just mentioned before from Diner, but also with, with other ones. And obviously, at the same time, we're ramping up our, our uh, manufacturing of, uh, of our autonomous vehicles as well. And over here in America, we're deploying those with uh, General Electric uh, since uh, a while back. And um, uh, kind of scaling all that out, we have seen many of these issues and uh, found ways to solve them. Because obviously, when you get to scale, you really need to tie in the whole ecosystem of infrastructure, of connectivity, of battery management, of your reporting, of transparency, and tying in and integrations with our customers. So that's why we're providing this all as a service uh, to shipper customers. We have a lot of them and, and other companies. Um, and uh, yeah, I think. Our, our company now is uh, beyond 300 people at this point, and we're growing super quickly. Uh, and, and with that, we're, we're just um, looking uh, to, to ramp up kind of CO2 metrics, which is the main thing we're about. It's about getting rid, rid of the 7% of global CO2 that, that comes from uh, heavy electric or heavy freight. Yeah. Yeah, and it's definitely critical in the industry to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I know there's a lot of challenges that are ahead, that it's something that has to happen. So it's looking good for, for this industry. Yeah, I was going to say that when it comes to energy mixes, it's obviously a huge thing. Coming out of Sweden, it's a little bit easier. We have lots of hydropower and, and nuclear energy. Here it's quite different. But I think that makes it even more important to look at it and understand the energy mix and the, the impact that has on your kind of CO2 emissions. Because obviously, eventually, uh, uh, even now we can do uh, heavy electric freight cost competitively if you have your planning done right. But planning is everything when it comes to running a fleet of heavy electric vehicles combined with the infrastructure to, to go with it. And that's one of the main things that we're solving and the way we deploy. Uh, but I think um, over time, electric heavy freight is for sure going to be uh, the cheapest. And if you look beyond that, uh, kind of uh, autonomous electric heavy freight on scale will be the cheapest means of transporting anything. And that's also why we're investing heavily. Again, you can look at the hardware that, that we have uh, in the showroom as well. Yeah, it's amazing. And then I know Einride is like also level five autonomy, I believe, in Europe and level four in, in North America, if I'm correct. I, I maybe you know better than I do. So I'd say we're, we're always level four, 
but um, we were kind of uh, splitting it. So we never have a person in the vehicle from the get-go. We said that basically there's no business case if you have a safety driver, and we need to figure out where can we deploy uh, our systems uh, where they can be useful from day one, rather than going into complicated situations where we need safety drivers and lots of data to try it out in order to get something there. And that way you can get to a cost competitive situa situation much, much faster and still meeting the safety requirements needed for deploying these at scale. Definitely, and then how do you see the ge geographical differences like in Europe versus America? And is it, is it easier in, in Europe, or what are your kind of skills on that expansion? I was gonna say, different things are easier in different places. Obviously in America, you can have this great entrepreneurial spirit and a uh, uh, necessity of change that everybody's feeling to applying the latest technology. Uh, in Sweden, I think, we have lots and lots of companies that are very, very concerned about sustainability. And when we got here, we thought maybe it's a bit different. Uh, but actually, uh, America is obviously a huge place so many diverse uh, uh, people all over the place, uh, and obviously there's a huge demand for uh, sustainable freight here as well, which we basically found. But uh, obviously connectivity is a lot harder over here. That's something that becomes very apparent as soon as you start working with it. And obviously uh, infrastructure again, a uh, large thing that's problematic uh, when you have the, the, uh, some of the problems that, that is, you can find here. Definitely, and, and what are your thoughts on international uh, scaling and, and infrastructure, for example, in the US or Europe? And So I have a little bit of experience uh, in this in my last job when I was at Google leading uh, energy infrastructure for Google's data centers. Uh, yeah, every single market's different. Um, when it comes to energy, even in the US, every single market is different. So I think you know one of the things that we think about a lot and expertise we bring is understanding the energy infrastructure, the way to interconnect the utility rules, um, that can really make or break the timeline for a project and the cost for a project in terms of putting a charging hub together. So, um, you know, when we think about international or different regional, uh, you know, US peculiarities, I think it's really important to understand what you're dealing with um, and really do that research ahead of time and understand that market and have those relationships, frankly, uh, ahead of time because that's what's gonna drive from the infrastructure that timeline timeline and cost, and I'll, I'll just take a second to think about cost too. I think you know one thing that we're seeing a lot of too is with the pilot programs, people can put these chargers within their house power, but when they go to the point to actually having you know 20% of a fleet electrified and they have dozens or maybe even 100 or plus vehicles that are electrified, the amount of infrastructure required actually starts to become a capital cost question in their minds. Um, you know, they're already buying vehicles that might be a little bit more expensive. Um, they might be, uh, you know, thinking about how to plan for that um, because it's a larger upfront investment. And then being told, by the way, you have to retrofit your building and you have to add all of this capital cost to your building. Or if you're leasing a building, uh, you need to work with your landlord to figure that out. That can be really difficult. Um, and so one of the things that we think about as part of the solution is how do you work with the utility, the site owner, and make sure that all of those costs are considered. And you know, one of, part of our solution is that we're able to cover that cost for customers and turn that capex into opex. And so, um, you know, thinking internationally, um, the structure of who owns the power lines and who provides the, the supply of energy and how you can, you know, decide if you want to pick this supplier or that supplier is a really critical aspect. And so, the regional differences can be pretty stark in how you develop. Yeah, makes sense. Go ahead. Yeah, I would just add to that and say on the cost point, it's extremely important to us that uh, the fleets and our customers are able to make this transition from an economic perspective and not just within a sustainability org or just you know purely a sustainability decision um, and so it's great that you know we're all focused on on costs and not just saying yeah it's electric and it's going to be a more expensive too bad um, it's hugely important to us and hugely important to our customers that we can compete with diesel and the existing infrastructure on a total cost of ownership basis so while an electric truck might cost you know, 20% more than a diesel, a lot of those fleets will make up um, that extra cost in savings in energy, for example, or savings in maintenance, or uh, savings in compliance, and so can make that decision with a, a kind of strong economic foundation. Awesome, and maybe you can each talk about some actual use cases and pilots where you've engaged customers and seen success. I know Einride has some major rollouts coming out yeah, yeah, we're, we're rolling out hundreds of vehicles uh, this year alone. 
uh, and with that, uh, it's, it's hard to say, but maybe we're the, the largest electric heavy fleet in the world. Um, but, but anyway, with that, uh, we, we started a few years ago with one of our customers, the Oatly, uh, over in, uh, in uh, Sweden. We've then, since then kind of followed them here and, and are um, uh, deploying with them here as well. Because uh, uh, they're a global company, they're focused on making uh, open products, and um, um, this is one of the things they really wanted solving. And obviously, right now, from a sustainable point of view, longer term, seeing the benefits of co in terms of cost. But uh, we need to be able to provide a, a system that ties everything they need uh, right now, instead of them having to be experts in all these different topics that that's needed. So uh, doing this in scale is uh, just immensely, uh, an immense learning, I think, for the ones that are right now trying out having one or two tracks. Uh, but um, I think it would be interesting when you have more companies trying to operate this at scale. And I think that's when the, the platform needs uh, becomes very, very apparent. And you also have news in North America, too, where you're expanding. Can you share some of those use cases? Yeah, yeah. So uh, in North America, obviously, as mentioned before, we have uh, the General Electric case. Uh, we're deploying at their site in Kentucky, Louisville. Uh, and um, uh, it's pretty large deployment. It's uh, fenced off to begin with, but uh, expanding into public roads as well from the autonomous side. At the same point, we're uh, building out these uh, um, heavy electric truck routes as well, and let, letting that lead the way, building up the inter infrastructure, getting the digitization levels of our customers up to a level where it can then be compatible with autonomous vehicles. Because obviously, when you don't have a cab, the, the ways of interaction is, is quite different. Uh, like, how do you get it to even get to the right dock when you're getting in through to the, the, the logistics center? Who's going to unload it? Who's going to tell it that it's done? Uh, stuff like that is processes that need uh, digital interfaces. And that's, that takes time. But I think starting now with our kind of heavy electric fleets, getting started with manned uh, heavy electric freight for a lot of the cases that we currently can't do autonomously, uh, we'll build up the infrastructure, get the digitization level done in order to be compatible with, uh, with autonomous trucks. And some of the other cases, uh, we're, we're deploying in, in three different states, I think, uh, this year. And um, that's going to be growing out super quickly here into hundreds of truck, trucks in America this year alone as well. Oh, it's amazing to see all the growth. Uh, and Niha, maybe you can share some of your use cases specifically. Yeah, one interesting thing that we've seen emerge is this concept of multiple fleets in one location. Um, you have fleets which have very different charging patterns. You might have something that needs to domicile overnight and can charge slowly, and you may have other use cases where they have very specific windows of the day where they need to come in and out and charge quickly at high power. And so we're seeing a strong interest in kind of this shared infrastructure concept. And everyone thinks in their mind, okay, it's like the shared ports, like a gas station, you can share those ports. But the real difficult piece of the infrastructure really is that power interconnect. And so being able to optimize throughout a day with different fleets at a site and thinking about how they can tap into that high power, which is really the scarce commodity. Um, we can buy chargers that have the right amount of power, but really getting enough power to power those chargers is really the constraint. So we're seeing these interesting use cases where you can optimize and then drive down that cost of infrastructure, which again drives that lowest cost of charging to drive those TCOs down for customers. So that's a really, um, I think, emerging use case that we're seeing that's a little bit different, I think, than um, how many people pilot, which is they try a couple of vehicles on their existing um, properties. Yeah, and for us, the, the truck that we have here today is, is really a platform. So it's our medium duty X platform, and uh, it's a class six vehicle, so up to 26,000 pounds of, of uh, total weight carrying capacity. And we use that platform for different use cases. So a fleet like FedEx would put a parcel delivery body on top of that platform to, li to deliver packages in cities. Um, one of our customers, Loomis, uses that same exact platform but puts a, a bulletproof body for, for cash carrying, an armored vehicle uh, body on top of it. And so it's, it's mostly urban delivery vehicles, but we also take the technology that we spent the last five years developing in the batteries and the software and the powertrain and offer that to other OEMs as well in, in other segments. So an example of that is uh, an OEM in California called Wiggins. They make these massive 36,000 pound capacity forklifts for ports and marinas. So they're moving containers and ports, um, they're using agriculture jobs, they're picking up boats in, in marinas, and that's a huge area of focus from a decarbonization perspective, because those can be a difficult 
a difficult place from an air quality perspective. And then what are your guys' thoughts on autonomous vehicles, for example, alongside electric vehicles? Do you think that they'll come at the same time? Do you think, uh, what is the speed of each to the market? So I think it's, it's always gonna be a mix. You're gonna need humans for certain things. You're just gonna be better at it, even if we look long term. But uh, I think, uh, especially if you look at the boring repetitive flows that is really not made for humans, perfect for robots. And that's exactly where, where we kind of started. Um, but uh, I think um, over time, you're gonna start seeing that you can implement them in more and more places. Another thing, as I mentioned, is kind of the digitization level needed to interact with some of them. Uh, I guess a lot of companies are building these self-driving hubs uh, where you're just tra driving them like, like trains. Certainly great for some use cases. Other times, it kind of adds complexity to your supply chain because uh, you maybe need to reload it, you need to understand when it arrives, and you need to solve even more problems than you had before. So for other use cases, it might not be the greatest match. And I think uh, over time, you're going to see the, the ODDs of, of these kinds of vehicles to expand uh, and, and therefore kind of be more easily integrated into even more flows. So, uh, but with that said as well, we, we think that even with, with our manned electric freight we can, uh, or electric freight systems, we can deploy up to 40% of the current uh, customer flows we've been looking at in America. Um, when it comes on the, the autonomous side, one of the ways we're flexible with our customers is that uh, we deploy with remote operators so we can make sure that we can solve that weird thing that they happen to have in their site and that weird circumstance because we can have a human in the loop that's uh, monitoring from outside, but using all the smarts of the autonomous driving systems to understand what's going on and, and help the systems when they get stuck. And so I think you're gonna have that mix of fully autonomous and kind of manned freight and then kind of the thing that's in between. How long do you think it will take for it to be fully autonomous across the majority of electric vehicles or trucks? Oh, that's a complicated question. <laughs> it depends on so many things. It depends on the kind of freight and, and speeds and everything. Uh, but I, I think, I think new, now in the next few years, um, obviously we're already seeing lots of autonomous systems. You can, if you look inside of factories, you can see them everywhere. Uh, now we can start seeing them outside of factories. You can see them in ports. Uh, but um, uh, it's basically just going to continue from there and be a progressive build-up uh, and just adding more and more uh, automated systems. Uh, over time, I think. So, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated question. Any other thoughts on, on that? Yeah, the fleets we're working with today are really looking for level two and not expecting level five. Um, but that, that's also a factor of the areas that we're uh, tackling in our use cases, right? The drivers uh, that use our trucks are doing a lot more than driving. They're you know, walking a package from the truck to the door. They're often the, a kind of salesperson or brand ambassador that's going into you know, a business and talking to their, their rep on the business side. So um, while it's going to be difficult to make that fully autonomous anytime soon, especially because they're, you know, in, in cities and going in and out of tight spaces, um, there's absolutely a place for the safety aspects of that technology. And that's extremely important to our customers um, to make the vehicle safer through uh, automated collision avoidance, lane keeping, and, and some of the, the kind of less sexy versions of autonomy that are out there today. I'll have a brief note, just on the transition itself, um, anyone who's doing autonomous is tech forward, and so many of these companies are coming to market with the intent of being EV first. And so um, there's a very important relationship between the two, and we think that's a whole new sector, and you'll see new OEMs emerge, and you'll definitely see uh, a lot of interest in electrification from, from that autonomous segment. I have to add to that that one of the things that, that I'm thinking a lot about is uh, right now most of the autonomous heavy freight is scaling out on top of diesel platforms. And if that infrastructure gets built, it's going to be there for the next 10 years. And the path to sustainability is going to take a lot longer and also the transition to electric heavy freight systems. So for me it's super important every day when I go to work to make sure that I can uh, put the heavy electric systems uh, sooner in time and make sure we get to that deployment because I see the, the diesel electric systems as just a, or, or diesel systems as just a, uh, you know, it's, it's not gonna be the optimal solution in the end. So we should just leapfrog that and go directly to where we need to be. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would not look forward to a future where uh, everything's just continue being diesel forever. Like if nobody's doing anything about it, I think uh, that that's a huge risk. 
Yeah, and, and there's also, uh, from a technology perspective and thinking through infrastructure, there are a number of um, companies working on uh, inductive charging, so wireless charging, where if a truck were autonomous, you actually wouldn't need somebody there at the depot to plug the truck in because it's charging inductively. It would drive over uh, a charging pad. And some of these companies are charging at really high rates, like 350 kilowatts. It's, it's a ton of power um, going from the ground into the truck. So it's really uh, an exciting vote of confidence for that, that marriage between autonomous and electric technology. Yeah, and from, from our side, maybe moving on to like investments and, and financing, uh, we've seen like both autonomous and electric are some of the hottest areas, like Too Simple, for example, is another startup that we've worked with that their market cap is like 10 billion right now. And it's just crazy to see how, uh, how expensive a lot of these startups are in the public markets. So you could take like Tesla or Rivian or all these startups that are doing electric vehicles. I know uh, XOS is already public. Uh, Einride's raising capital like crazy. What are your views on in terms of financing going forward in, in these markets? For us, it's, it's going to continue to be uh, um, cost intensive, so capital intensive. Uh, but uh, I think basically for every more natural disaster you get, unfortunately, the, 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 how pressing it is to get some of these systems on road just becomes very clear. And I think the investment potential for some is very much clear that way. Horrible, but, but true. Uh, so I think uh, this is just going to become more and more evident that we need massive investments from society to make sure that we can uh, move this technology into uh, as large use as possible as soon as possible. And for sure, eventually, just the unit economics of things will, will drive it to be electric uh, and autonomous. But uh, I think for sure, um, the, the investment climate long term will, will just, just be there. But at some certain point, the, the cost benefits will just be abundantly clear. And then, you know, it's a pretty good business to be in. Definitely. Okay, next. Yeah, we see that charging could be a whole new asset class. Uh, I think I mentioned my background is in data centers, and that is an asset class that has emerged over the last 20 years. And it's actually quite similar to what you need for charging again, the site, the power, the on-site infrastructure. And given the number of dollars required to put one of these together, um, it's going to require significant amounts of capital and investment. But we, our, our belief is that this is just a whole new asset class. Uh, we think about this transition at the scale of what happened when we built the highway system. Um, that was a whole network of infrastructure that had to be built and for charging and for full electrification, you will need that similar network. And so um, we think it's super exciting because it's a really investable asset class, um, but there will be obviously billions and billions of dollars required to, to fund this. Yeah, I think it's important to, it, it, these are certainly capital intensive endeavors, but it's important to keep it in the context of the alternative, which is, is more expensive to clean up these problems uh, as they become you know, more and more real in our, our day to day lives, like weather events and everything else that we're seeing. Um, we're really excited that I think the, the sentiments and the mood around electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles have really shifted in the last five years or so. I think we uh, have seen investors that have kind of turned the corner and understood that these are some of the biggest problems of our time and worth putting capital into. Um, in the early days of our business, we talked to a lot of, you know, your Sand Hill Road style VCs who weren't really excited about hardware at all, right? Everyone's looking for a B2B SaaS play and, and a, a quick and easy way to make money. Um, but we were fortunate to find folks uh, on the strategic side, um, a group called Perez Ventures, who uh, we knew through our, one of our tier one suppliers, Metalsa, um, is part of their group, and they're the lar one of the largest frame rail companies in the world and a massive tier one supplier in the space. So we look for folks like that can, that can take a, a more strategic view and a more strategic outlook and understand the space that we play in. So I'd encourage uh, any of the folks who are uh, involved in a startup and looking to raise capital to think through who those strategic players can be that can help you. Uh, and another way to do that is go through a group like Plug and Play. We were involved in some of the, the early cohorts in our business and met a ton of great strategics through that community as well. Thanks, appreciate the support. Um, and then, so, so one thing also we do at Plug and Play is we work with a lot of big corporates like Walmart, or we run roundtables with like Walmart and JB Hunt and Ryder and a lot of the big trucking fleets. And one of the big trends we also see is like hydrogen uh, for trucks. Is, 
I'd love to hear your perspective on that and how realistic it is as well. I think um, uh, it's kind of a divided community, right? You have some track manufacturers um, in Sweden, for example, Scania, kind of the Volkswagen group, who's very much taking a stance against it. Uh, you have others like Daimler and Volvo, who's very much saying we're both. Um, I think there is major issues with hydrogen in terms of energy efficiency. I think there's also issues around the infrastructure to support it. The biggest issue of all, I think, is currently the OEMs are putting timelines on like 2020x. It's not even set. And if you're, if you're somebody who's thinking about investing in the infrastructure needed to, to have a sustainable uh, freight system, will you dare to then uh, invest in that if you think, if, if the manufacturer's telling, well, maybe down the line there's going to be this other system and you have to throw away all your cash and, and that. And I think it's a bit dangerous to have this uncertainty about the future of it. So I actually believe battery electric systems is the better one. Uh, I think I'm happy to be disproven of that, but I think uh, it's going to be able to be more cost efficient. It's going to be uh, better off of an of a energy uh, point of view. And uh, I think we do also don't need massive infrastructure to move the whole stuff around everywhere. Uh, so right now we're kind of sticking with battery electric systems. And I think the change needs to start now. We can't wait for hydrogen. Yeah, interesting. Okay, Niha, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I would just echo all of that. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, all of that. I think the time frames that we're talking about for hydrogen versus EVs, um, you know, EVs have a huge head start and they will get traction in the market well before hydrogen can get to the level of efficiency and cost. And so um, we think EVs are the way forward. Yeah, I'm going to be careful not to wade too deeply into this one, and Thomas said it well, but it's, it's, for us it was about simplicity. We chose an electric powertrain because it's a, a really simple solution, and it's okay to us that we're only solving the problem for fleets that are operating in 200 miles or less. That's a massive chunk of global freight movement, uh, and the technology will continue to push forward and will take, you know, ease into 300, 400, 500 miles over time as the technology improves. Um, Hydrogen is, is a little more complex. I think there's uh, every hydrogen vehicle is an electric vehicle to a degree. There is a battery system on board to store that energy, but an additional system on board, you have to think through the infrastructure, like we're talking about the infrastructure challenge on electric vehicles, but there is already a grid to start with, so there's a bit of a head start there. Um, and so you get into setting up, you know, production of hydrogen and storage and moving it around, it starts to get a little bit of a little bit complicated. That said, I think it's it's great that there's investment looking into hydrogen and trying to make that a reality for the future, um, and that there are probably use cases that make a lot of sense for it. But we're we're looking at the low hanging fruit, um, which is electric vehicles, medium and heavy duty for that 200 mile and less use case. One thing I also want to add to that is um, coming out of Sweden, a major industry is steel, and the way to make steel lost, uh, less uh, or more sustainable and emit less CO2. That's used hydrogen for steel production as well. So I think that hydrogen is needed in other places where we don't have other ways of, of um, doing it, basically. So, uh, I, yeah, I would, I would rather see that the focus is strongly on, on battery electric systems and you can solve the range anxieties in, in better planning rather than trying to solve it with the infinite range solutions. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay, well, we have a minute 30 left, so maybe if everyone wants to share up to 30 seconds their vision or anything that they missed to the audience, uh, we'll start maybe with, with Einrad. Oh, yeah, no, I think I got through it all. <laughs> I, this is just so exciting. It's, uh, I heard someone, oh, heard someone say today that, wow, there's a lot of electric vehicle stuff here at this conference, which this is my first time here, but uh, certainly uh, it sounds like there's a transition happening within the logistics um, ecosystem and people are really excited about this and I just think that we're gonna be here next year and this room will be full so uh, super exciting yeah I think ours are the only two electric vehicles here so the the auto the automation folks have some catching up to do in terms of uh, changing over their diesel systems to electric um, but yeah we're really excited we're, we're in a period of growth for the company um, really scaling production this year and uh, I think you know, one of the things that we talked about is a really important message to, to fleets in the room thinking through their electrification strategy is to get started early on on infrastructure and think about the different pieces involved, not just the hardware, um, but also the, the services and support um, that, that can be provided by a company like Exos or, or these guys uh, to help ease that transition. And um, 
it's, it's better to get started early on. Awesome, well thank you so much to the panelists and thank you to Pam and the Manifest team for putting this together.